everyone to your house um, on behalf of the European Parliament Liaison Office in the United Kingdom. My name is Anna Hood, I'm the Culture and Education Coordinator, Project Coordinator here. And my job is very easy and very short to give a very warm welcome to all of you. A very warm welcome to our partners, speakers, guests, the Ukrainian Institute London. It's always wonderful to work with you, to Maria Tumakin, and I will need to check your family, Polisha Kravachuk, director of the Ukrainian Institute London. This is already the fifth event we are co-organizing together. It's always a big pleasure, and we are really honored to have your event and to work with you here at Europe House. And um, it's also I, what I wanted to, to mention that we have an exhibition on the corridor of our world. Maybe you have seen that passing soon. Um, it is also an exhibition related to and uh, telling Ukrainian stories. It's a photo exhibition titled What Would You Take? And it tells the story of Ukrainian refugees. So I just wanted to say that we are we, we would like to support um, Ukraine in all means uh, with our programs and also um, giving space and hosting such wonderful events like today. today. Thank you again. And now I'm passing on the microphone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so we, we just had a little chat and we're, we're both lecturers and we're both used to projecting. These mics are a little bit odd to hold. If you can't hear us, just wave and we'll speak up or we will then start using the mics if that's okay. But I think you can hear me all right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah great. And I think, Marie, oh, you'll, yes. yeah, you'll be fine. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Mike's. We might turn to you at some point, but not yet. Thank you so much, Europe House, um, European Parliament Liaison Office in the UK. It's so wonderful to have you as partners and for you to host us here so regularly. It's, it's been such a pleasure working with you. Um, thank you for, to all of you for coming here tonight. I noticed what the weather's like outside and we were wondering whether anybody was going to swim through that weather, but you made it and it's absolutely wonderful. And I'm so glad because I am so delighted to welcome Maria Tamakin all the way from Australia. Uh, such a treat and, and it will be a treat indeed. I'll, I'll do the formal introduction now and, and then we'll have a little conversation. We'll leave plenty of time for questions from the audience as well. So Maria Tomarkin is a Ukrainian Jewish Australian writer, cultural historian. She was born and raised in Kharkiv. She in Soviet Ukraine at the time. <laughs> she is the author of four books, including uh, books of ideas, including Trauma Scapes and Otherland. And her most recent book, Axiomatic, won the Melbourne Prize for Literature, Literature's Best Writing Award. Um, and was listed in New Yorker's top 10 books in 2019. Uh, Maria collaborates with musicians and visual artists and writes pieces for performance and radio. She works on sites of trauma and has influenced researchers and artists worldwide. And she is associate professor in, in creative writing program of the University of Melbourne. Maria, welcome. Welcome to London. Thank you so much, Alessia. <laughs> thank you. Can you. Can you hear us? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, just recognizing that I'm kind of sitting, I'm privileging the, the other two thirds so I will be doing um, wild rotation of my body from time to time, I think. Yeah. I, I will put it here just in case it does pick up a little bit of, of, of our voices. Maria, well, this is a bit of a strange situation because you were supposed to be interviewing me uh, and now I'm interviewing you instead. Um, we met in Australia in February and we sort of said a uh, brief goodbye because we were going to meet, uh, I think, in March or April at the Adelaide Writers Week online with you, me, and Katerina Babkina. And then the three of us decided to withdraw. And you wrote a masterpiece of an open letter explaining that withdrawal. Um, if you haven't read that open letter, please go to Maria's website and read it. It truly is a, a, a masterpiece. Um, tell us a little bit about that decision. And what I'm really interested in exploring is what does it mean to say no? to an important platform, to a, to a platform that is given to Ukrainians to speak about Russia's genocidal war in Ukraine. Um, and you know we've embraced such platforms, we've been fighting for them, we've been looking for them for so long. Why is it important to sometimes say no? Um, thank you so much, Alessia. I just want to thank you and Europe House, and thank you, Anna, um, and thank you to all of you for coming here. It's actually, um, it's really, it feels, the burden of responsibility for speaking about Ukraine right now is very, very palpable. I feel it, I feel it. 
physically and, and it's a real honor actually to be in this space and a real honor to be um, in conversation with you this is not empty words so I just wanted to start there um, we were supposed to be so Adelaide Writers Week is a, probably a top literary uh, festival in Australia which has actually a, a very high number of literary festivals um, the reason that we felt the need to withdraw is that one of the guests uh, one of the writers and we are going to be not kind of naming names because that's really not necessary it doesn't get at the heart of the matter in, in, in terms of what we want to discuss uh, but one of the guests um, uh, prior prior to the start of the festival um, was on social media just writing despicable grotesque tweets and, and uh, about Zelensky as the kind of the the Nazi of the century uh, just using this terrible kind of Russian propaganda uh, sort of tropes of Ukraine as a Nazi state, uh, Zelensky as a kind of Jewish figurehead that who is in fact kind of legitimizing in the eyes of the West, you know, all, all these horrible um, kind of intolerable things. Um, and um, that, that, that writer was kind of... Uh, engaging this conversation that writer did not have any skin in the game they, they they did not care about ukraine this was a kind of a different conversation that they were having and the conversation that i think we've seen kind of a lot in the west which is how american imperialism is the imperialist that we all need to battle and russian imperialism is actually not kind of gets in the way uh, a kind of a something that obscures the you know the true enemy of all the anti-imperialists there so on the altar of uh, that particular struggle, Ukraine was just thrown to kind of, to keep making the points about the fact that America is the villain um, and Russia is somehow in, in that context, somehow gets off the hook or somehow is, sits differently in relation to that kind of um, anti-colonial struggle and so forth. So um, when we brought our kind of sense of like what the hell is going on to the festival director, uh, we got the kind of response that I think has become re really familiar in the West that I have a lot of issues with, which is the response about, you know, the importance of the public square, you know, we need to all come together and have sort of conversations about difficult topics, including, you know, who's a Nazi and who's not. Um, and, and you know, we got a lot of kind of rhetoric around the kind of the, the freedom of speech and the importance of kind of public debate and public conversation, which is, um, to me, is absolutely morally indefensible when we deal with the genocidal war. Ideas, uh, sort of abstract ideas do not, get to come in front of uh, thousands of people who have been killed, tortured, kidnapped, etc. Uh, but the, the desire to hang on and, and, and a real kind of dogged determination to hang on to the ideas of freedom of speech, where to me a much more important concept comes from the kind of decolonial praxis and is the concept of harm minimization. So instead of fighting for, you know, we all need to come together and have those difficult conversations. Actually, how can we come together if we need to come together and what kind of conversations actually do not kind of perpetuate violence, do not injure, do not harm, do not produce more pain and suffering and do not make people who are thrown in, in, in this kind of genocidal war feel abandoned um, and like they, they, they don't matter. So harm minimization didn't matter. What mattered was a kind of a, a heightened rhetoric about public squares and whatever. And I and Alessia and Katerina, we just, we did not buy any of it. And we just felt the need to withdraw. And then there was like a lot of <laughs> media coverage about, you know, not about really the heart of the matter, which is normal. Um, and but no apology and no and I was really quite struck. I thought, okay, you know, I'm in Australia, but not to apologize to Alessia, not to apologize to Katerina, not to acknowledge that their withdrawal comes, um, you know, comes from a place of pain, comes from a place of actually being being injured by the choices made by the <laughs> festival director. There was absolutely no acknowledgement, but a real kind of doubling down on you know, on let's let's all come together. And we know it's not possible to come together at the time of the, at the time like this, we cannot come together. And these ideas actually 
both fraudulent and harmful. So I am, I am against mm. the idea of conversation somehow sitting on top of human suffering and histories of colonialism and histories of pain and, and violence. And that moment of saying no created that space for discussion not in the festival, but about the the issues of conversation. Why should Ukrainians be forced to, you know, share platforms with people that don't they don't feel comfortable sharing platforms and with and so on? So in some ways, that that stance of refusing to be part of the conversation created a, a much healthier conversation, in my view. At least, you know, we were not necessarily participating in it. Your your open letter didn't participate in it, but I could see some of the media com coverage engaging in that, saying, that, "Okay, what does this mean to us?" And we need to talk about. It. And of course, Ukrainian writers, writers in particular, but not only writers, intellectuals, um, have refused on numerous occasions to appear on platforms with um, Russians or Russian writers, um, regardless of their political opinions, yeah. and often have been really severely criticized for that. Yeah. And it's funny how difficult it is to accept the fact that you know, at this stage, uh, we can't create reconciliatory talks. What we want to talk about is justice. We, we, when this is not the time to talk about reconciliation or dialogue and so on. This is the time to talk about the acknowledgement of war crimes and time to talk about justice and how we arrive yeah. at that. Um, yeah, well, thank you for, for, for doing that and leading the way for me and Katya. Um, so you clearly are a woman who isn't as afraid of speaking her mind, uh, calling a spade a spade. And I saw another example of that in your recent piece for Sydney Review of Books, uh, where you, aha, so I wasn't the only one who read the piece. Um, I can see the response in the audience where you engage in a, in a conversation of sorts with Annie and Erno. Um, I wonder if you could treat us to an extract from that piece, read it to us, and maybe talk a little bit about it. Thanks so much, Alessia. Um, and I just, just, just to say one more thing about sort of now is not the time for dialogue. I think being comfortable with the idea of irreconcilable differences and not pushing towards a reconciliation, even as something that's on the horizon, let alone something that can be enacted now. I think it's really, really important, and I think it's the only way through this. There will be this. This will take, you know, hundreds, hundreds of years now, and there won't be any reconciliation. And the fantasy of reconciliation is really harmful as well. And again, this is something that we know in other contexts, particularly the decolonial contexts um, across the world. So irreconcilable differences, and kind of sit with that. Right? And we'll sit with that. Um, I, I don't know where to, uh, unless I said, you know, found the bit that's, that, you know, you think works, I have no idea. So I'm just going to read from the start, um, but perhaps it will kind of set things up. So um, Annie Ernaud is a French writer. She's in her 80s. She is the kind of the, uh, a, a really a legendary figure for many people. Do people know Annie Ernaud? Yeah. Okay. Um, Yes, so um, <laughs> just, just what, what sort of occurred to me is that a really good friend of mine who's a literary scholar said that the achievement um, of this piece, said to me the achievement of this piece is that you made me hate Arnaud. So if I do this to you, I will feel um, both elated and, and conflicted <laughs> about, about what, what that is like. For, for you, but nonetheless, <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, nothing says, um, yeah, middle-aged as taking the glasses off, um, putting them on, <laughs> doing this, doing this, so, um, yeah. I Hopefully, do that too, and, and I haven't identified myself as middle-aged as well. Yeah. Okay. Maybe or now having, is the time. Or having three pairs. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so try, I'm, I'm going to try. Okay, and to those people who actually can speak French, and unlike me, my apologies for the way that I, I'm sure, mispronounce Arnaud's surname with my, you know, Eastern European inflections. Um, what a time to be reading about any Arnaud's self-obliterating affair with S, so she uses the initial, from the Soviet embassy in Paris. Not that you sense that something is in the air from the English language reception to getting lost. Ernaud's diary of the relationship published in English last September, so September 2022. In the diary and in, in its generally admiring reviews, S is described as a diplomat, apparatchik, attaché, faithful servant of the USSR, that's, that's the quote from Ernaud, and Brezhnev nostalgic Stalin apologist when drunk. Also, quote, he's somewhat, not to say very anti-Semitic, 
Isn't Mitterrand Jewish? End of quote. Pretty standard stuff. Come on, he would have been KGB. And it matters not because he may or may not have tried recruiting Arnaud, as kept their affair secret and appeared uninterested in converting her into an asset or using her connections. His anti-intellectualism was a turn-on for Arnaud. It's possible, in fact, Arnaud was so erotically dazzling she short-circuited without realising some good old planned sexual espionage. If so, I'd like to read about it. She, though, wasn't remotely intrigued by, by what S did when not with her. Quote, I never knew anything about his activities, which officially were related to culture. Today, I am amazed that I did not ask more questions. End of quote. Culture, my ass. The KGB thing matters because an account of a prominent French writer, one of the greats to many, the most recent Nobel Prize winner, losing her mind of a KGB stooge in the dying days of the Soviet Union, reads, lands, seats, sticks, whatever the verb, differently after 24th February 2022. The affair started in 1988 with Anne in the Soviet Union on what she calls a writer's junket, an S accompanying, accompanying, that's a quote from her, foreign writers taking in the sites. KGB operatives, not enthusiastic city ambassadors, accompanied foreigners on their official culture trips to the Soviet Union. And soon after S was posted to Paris, they got deeper in with each other. The relationship ended in November 1989, a week or so after Berlin's wall came down and a few weeks before my family left Kharkiv in Ukraine, stripped of our Soviet citizenship on the way out. S and his wife, of course he was married, she was his embassy secretary, went the opposite direction, back to the Soviet Union, S disappearing from Erdogan's life except for one visit on 20th of January 1991 of a few hours not entirely clear how blissful or owing to which geopolitical forces spent in bed. I'm the same age Arnaud was when she fell off a cliff with S. It's 2023. Another diplomat slash attaché slash apparatchik S, S. Lavrov, is Russia's Minister of Foreign Affairs. S. Lavrov was once, con once considered not to be, to be not total war criminal material. He was cultured. Now, when I bump into his grotesque mug on the news, I see only a bench at The Hague. Ukraine is my homeland, I'm furious. Not so much with Arnaud, but with critics who barely mention in the English language reviews, I've seen what it might mean to be talking about getting lost as Russia, the Soviet Union's successor, occupying the USSR's permanent seat on the UN Security Council, a body it had as I write, it was that April, that horrible April where they were, you know, heading it. Um, kills, rapes, bombs, tortures and kidnaps Ukrainians as she doesn't let families bury their dead as she tries, fails to freeze millions into submission and she, as she engages in gas and oil terrorism while repeatedly threatening the world but Ukrainian, Ukrainians first with nuclear weapons. This sentence will get away from me. I'll stop. Perhaps critics are simply too sophisticated to mix context with subtext, author with authorial persona, Reality was representation, production was consumption, hence the no mentioning war vibe. But mixing up is precisely what's necessary in the second year of Russia's genocidal war in Ukraine. At this moment in history, Pushkin belongs with Putin, Sabalenka with Lukashenko. Proclamations of separate domains, literature and politics, war and sport can't stand our lies. And I'll just read one more paragraph and end there. Watching YouTube, Lukashenko, raise a toast to Sabalenka's victory at this year's Australian Open. We showed you, you Western Biden's ass leaking na NATO puppet fuckers, I'm paraphrasing. Watch on YouTube, Sabalenka decry the pressure placed on her, a tennis player, to speak out against the war. It's really tough for me to understand why so many people really hate me for no reason, like no reason. I mean, like I did nothing, not paraphrasing. I was there on day one of the Open when a bunch of young men when a bunch of young men unveiling a Russian flag taunted Ukrainian player as she played a Russian opponent on court 14, which had two statisticians, but no security. When I asked the men to take the, down the flag, they told me, laughing, sport and politics shouldn't mix. They were ready with their response. Boom, boom. Did tennis tournament director Craig Tiley and his team also know it was all bullshit 
when they allowed players from Russia and Belarus to compete under the neutral white flag because denying them entry would be, quote, unfair, plus, quote, bad for tennis, should neutral go in quote marks as well. So I'll just be there. Thank you so much for reading that passage. I want to once again uh, read one of the sentences that you just read. At this moment in history, Pushkin belongs with Putin, Sabalenka with Lukashenko. And another sentence which is further down in that piece, honestly, culture, in inverted commas, never meant less to me in my life, but I don't assume it's the same for most readers. There's this overwhelming desire to separate politics and culture, especially in the West. We've seen it here in London, we see it all over Western Europe, we see it in North America, we see it everywhere, and somehow separate Pushkin and Putin. Um, wh where did we go wrong? We, meaning Ukrainians, we, the ones who have been teaching the literatures of the region and so on. I know where the Russians uh, when right as it were for their purposes they've invested an awful lot of money into soft culture um you know i i can't think of a of a an opera house or a, or a theater that hasn't had Dada Vanya on, you know or swan lake or whatever although we'd like to see swan lake on tv those of those of you yeah. who know what i'm referring to as soon as possible yeah. but uh, where, did, where did we go wrong why is it so difficult for western intellectuals cultural elites and so on to understand that putin does belong pushkin does belong with putin yeah i wonder um if it's if the question where did we go wrong is kind of maybe there is a sort of bigger question there the this the need to separate culture from politics and to kind of to declare i mean the amount of sort of distress and anxiety over the cancellation quote unquote of russian culture versus the amount of distress and anxiety over the murder of um, civilians and and soldiers you know most of whom are civilians um, anyway, I mean, that, that equation is really, really startling. Why, and, and, and to me, um, you know, when you think about sort of Russian culture, you think about, you know, Pushkin over the theater in Mariupol. Like once, once you see that image, you know, Pushkin and Tolstoyevsky or whatever, like on, on the facade of that building as that building is being sort of cover up, covered up, um, how can you sort of claim um, that that separation is something tangible or something that should be upheld or something we're going to be fighting for. That separation does not exist to my mind. And we, of course, know, um, you know, the way that uh, culture is sort of implicated. And, 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 and I don't think that's true just for Russian culture. I mean, we're just now face to face with the enormity of that as an example and with the consequences of the idea that somehow, you know, uh, Russian culture exists in some kind of oppositional space, in a, a space of uh, speaking truth to power, of a space of upholding um, universal values that are being kind of eroded or etc. by, by the, the political system. And we, we understand that this is completely untrue. They are deeply, deeply enmeshed and Russian culture constantly provides inspiration constantly provides a, a kind of framework provides a cover smoke and mirrors everything for for precisely what we're seeing this uh unhinged imperialism and 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 this idea that you know ukraine sort of absolutely needs to be erased and and then of course it, it doesn't stop um at ukraine so if we see if we see the evidence in front of us, even if we were the kind of people, and perhaps I was that person too, who wanted to think that culture somehow can sit outside of a political sphere, we, we, we cannot hold on to that, to, to, to that kind of terrible illusion. And I was really struck, um, people would remember probably when Elizabeth Gilbert um, sort of, you remember, yeah, she, she said, I'm going to postpone the publication of my book that is set in Russia. Uh, now is not the time. And here's this person who is like, fine, she's fine. Like postponing that book is fine. And, and you, you know, I saw a lot of people, you know, uh, from Ukraine saying, thank you. Like, thank you. Again, that's harm minimization. You don't need to wheel out your book set in Russia, heroizing some kind of, you know, oppositional little cluster there. Now is not the time. And then the Western kind of literary Twitter and then it kind of went through Lit Hub and The Guardian and all the other sort of uh, sort of usual usual places kind of went into this is the slippery slope 
first Elizabeth Gilbert, you know, does not bring her out her book about, you know, set in Russia, then, you know, they're going to tell us uh, you know, where we can set our books, then people who, you know, then people will be pressured only to write books, you know, set in, in a supermarket around the corner from their place or whatever. And the, and I'm just like, man, there is, people are being killed, this genocide happening right now. What are you, what, what, why, why is this so, why does it feel so incredibly important and so incredibly threatening and in need of 12,000 op-eds and what, you know, and, and, and to me, and again, I'm, I'm coming back to the kind of ideas that, in, in, you know, when we think about kind of decolonial practices, again, across the world, where the idea that uh, the right of the writer to do whatever, that idea has been dead for, for decades. We have replaced the idea of rights with the idea of responsibility and accountability. And literature does not become worse, literature becomes better when it labours under the pressure of those moral imperatives, right? It doesn't all of a sudden, well, everyone is just scared to be writing their great, great books. I think it works in a completely opposite way. And yet there is a, a kind of a, an attachment and the depths of that attachment to the idea of like, don't touch the writer, don't tell the writer what to do, let the writer roam. And, and again, this is such a suspect idea and it has emerged you know, and has kind of flourished like in, in, in front of us at this time. And that's, um, that's something that, again, is very telling um, and brings us back to, you know, what are we, what are we holding on to and why? And, and that, I think, is the question that really needs to be asked again and again. That's my wild movement of the body. <laughs> Responsibility and accountability, those are words yeah. I think very important. And I, and I say to my, I say to my students uh, where I teach, I say, you know, there is this idea, when we talk about ethics in literature, people who really don't want to have that conversation, they kind of, uh, they collapse the idea of ethics in the idea of moralizing. And then under the guise of like, you know, this is a kind of a moralizing sort of, you know, energy that's coming at us. They, they they sort of fold the conversation about ethics, but ethics has nothing to do with moralizing. Writing or any creative endeavor, uh, you know, happens in an ethically charged field. It's an ethical sort of activity, right? So to somehow replace the idea of ethics with the idea of moralizing, you know, is again something that I think happens a lot. Thank you for that really important answer. Maria, I'm going to um, ask you about this really dreaded uh, thing for people, you're a fellow immigrant, uh, people with uh, permanent identity crises, I think, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm one like that myself. And, and the idea is, I, the concept is identity. I'm going to ask you about identity. I'm going to ask you about your identity. So I introduced you, as you introduce yourself, as Ukrainian Jewish Australian writer. A twofold question: Why not just write them? <laughs> and second, can you comment on all three of those parts and the order they appear in, yeah. and your road to putting them in that order? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, like, I wish I could. I, I wish I could talk about who I am in in a different way. One of the things that kind of concerns me, and, and some writers from other contexts have spoken about it, the idea of a hyphen. When we put hyphens between different parts of our identity, it sort of suggests that some kind of, some kind of editive process, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, all stirred together and, and you get me. Um, but of course, as you would know, Alessia, and if, can I flag that I'd love for you to speak about that as well but um, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about it um, but uh, you know how to speak about parts of your identity where the order changes as you say that can at times be in very significant tension with each other and at times be maybe even in, at war with each other uh, that again are not harmoniously interconnected and interrelated but um, exist in, in a state of dynamism and complexity um, and um, and I think you know why Ukrainian now if another what is most threatened comes first so if if there was a another Holocaust um, happening right now the, the kind of the, the 
with, with the Jewish people, sorry, there are many different Holocausts, but um, I would put, I would say Jewish, Ukrainian, Australian, I think. So Ukrainian is because it's most precious and most threatened and most in danger, in, not in terms of how I feel about myself, but in terms of what's happening in the world. Um, but it's, it's really, really complicated and there is a lot of tension and I know I, I told you and I'll briefly speak about the kind of the Jewish part of it. Um, I've become really close friends with a woman from Kiev who's currently uh, at the University of Melbourne where I am. She's under the Scholars at Risk program. Um, both of us were invited by the Australian Holocaust Museum to come to the International Holocaust Remembrance Day and to light a candle for Ukraine. We were very honoured, we, we came, we lit a candle. Um, and then when sort of survivors and, um, and, and second generation, third generation survivors in the room um, learned about where we were from, the question about anti-Semitism in Ukraine was like the one most frequently asked. And this was extremely confronting and something that we had to kind of address again and again and was really confronting for Galina. Um, but something that, you know, is again, you know, there is a really, really difficult history and I absolutely trust, that, you know, the Second World War history and so forth and the history prior to that. And then, of course, the history of, you know, anti-Semitism, etc. And I trust, I absolutely trust that Ukraine will will do the work of reckoning when the time, when the time comes. There are more pressing things that need to happen first when the time comes that that work of reckoning with the history, with the Second World War history, will be done in a way that was never done in Russia. And this is part of the reason what, that, you know, we're facing what we're facing because there was no, no work of actually, you know, and, and Germany is usually cited as an example, but I do think that's a very legitimate thing to say, you know, 50 years of denazification does give you does give you something, although we can talk about Germany in relation to Ukraine and the complexity there, but 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 nonetheless. Um, so there is, uh, you know, these parts of my identity are sometimes um, coexist in an uneasy way, but they represent the entirety of me. And, mm -hmm. And I absolutely can no longer speak about myself without saying all the parts. Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting way of uh, choosing the order. That which is threatened most comes first yeah. uh, and perhaps takes up most of your space, your yeah. headspace as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 I, I think that really speaks to me as well. What, what about you, Alessia? Oh, we're not here to talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> if I the, reflected. If I, the, if I'm the, giving you a fair warning. If this time, I, I well, I, you encouraged me to think about it differently, so I'll go away and think about it and then I'll come up with a better answer. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Your book, Trauma Escapes, I mean, it's in the title of, of the talk that we advertise today. Um, you, you define it in different ways in the book, and, and I, I picked two quotes uh, that really spoke to me. You say that trauma escapes were haunting and haunted places. They were not poetic or metaphorical terrains, but rather concrete material sites where visible and invisible, past and present, physical and metaphysical came to coexist and share a common space. And in other part, you say that the power that they are endowed with enables them not, uh, not just to carry and give voice to the past, but also to reveal hints and signs of the future. The entirety of Ukraine is a trauma scape, we can say. We can probably see it as such now. What can it tell us about the future? How can it potentially encourage us to begin to think how to heal? Yeah, I, I should say that um, I wrote those quotes and that book came out in 2005. So hearing your voice from 18 years ago is like hearing an absolute stranger. I'm, I'm not trying to design my no, quotes, no, no. but there is that kind of, oh, did I say that? I'll say, very, very I'll, I'll clever say, things. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> it's all been downhill from 2005. Um, so I, I'm just going to take a step back um, because hopefully it will be useful for people in the room. Um, I guess I've I really I've I've been sort of really focused on at, on the physical sides of trauma, and as you <laughs> the first quote 
kind of mentions there is a way in which it can be sort of you can just poetically or metaphorically speak about it so always kind of thinking about the physical the material the tangible this is that place it starts here it ends here and so forth that has been really really important but what have what i have discovered and hopefully this will allow me to, to talk a little bit about the future what i kind of discovered um, um is a slightly self-aggrandizing word but what my research has revealed to me um, is that these places, sites of trauma, are not kind of backdrops to events. Well, this event, you know, this destruction or this devastation, or this terrorist attack or um, this fire happened to um, to be here. They actually incredibly kind of culturally and transculturally significant places, and their significance connects to the role that they play in individual and collective experiences of grieving. So kind of the public life of grief, that's really important. Meaning making, which happens across generations, um, and also uh, memory, you know, forms of remembering, which also is a kind of intergenerational sort of process. So one of the things that I have kind of been able to, 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 to see through that research is that sometimes we ask not the wrong questions, but the questions that obscure other questions equally as important. So when we look at a site of trauma, we kind of go, and I think that's going to be, the, the, and it has already been happening, the, the question kind of constantly asked in Ukraine, and understandably, what should we do with this place? And then the options would be, you know, do you kind of memorialise the entirety or part of it? Do you reconstruct it? Do you combine reconstruction with some form of memorialization and what kind of my research has suggested to me is that the question that we should be asking first is what do these places do rather than what do we what should we do with those places so instead of kind of like just we need to kind of step back and try to understand the role that these places play and i think this size of trauma will play an incredibly important role and very varied role if we think about occupied territory, territories and when they're going to be deoccupied and there will be all these sites of um, terrible atrocities and, and, and torture and so forth. Then there will be sites of destruction like in places like Kharkiv that have never been occupied, then there will be Kherson, you know, and, and so forth. Um, and I, I think it's just really, really important to kind of think, okay, the options are not reconstruction and memorialization. The options are actually much more complex and much more varied. Um, and we need to kind of try to understand how people use those places. Do they come together? Do they bring people who were not there to those places to talk about what happened? Do they, are there forms of public grieving that will start happening? There is a way in which, you know, is there other conversations and debates that are being sparked by, by those places. Let's not close them down by deciding to rebuild or memorialize or some combination of the two. Let's have a much more nuanced conversation, to, and which is kind of so incredibly difficult. And I recognize that because as you say, the whole culture, sorry, the whole, the whole country um, is a trauma scape, but let's not rush and let's not think that um, these are the only two options. And what it allows us to do is also to think about trauma. So like I'm, I'm seeing in relation to Ukraine, people kind of using PTSD as a way of talking about trauma, but it's a very limiting and limited way of talking about trauma. It's really, really important because it destigmatizes, um, you know, the, the, the kind of terrible burdens that people carry that do not have any sort of um, external outward manifestations and, and and it's really really important especially in in a somewhat patriarchal culture uh, where sort of if you don't have visible injuries and so forth there may be a hierarchy of injuries or hierarchy of traumas etc so that is a very very important thing that it can be done but also ptsd comes from a particular context it depoliticizes the trauma it decollectivizes the trauma because it says you know, what do you do? You have a PTSD, you, can't, you go, you see a therapist, you, you kind of, you work towards um, your, some, some kind of, move, you know, you try to move through it, you try to find ways of living it. The burden is on the person. I think the idea of recovery can become this violent thing where it's like, recover already, 
right? You know, come on, recover. It's you know, and it's and, and it places the burden of carrying this um, experience that is both collective, deeply collective, and also individual, of course, and familial on onto people's shoulders. So, I, I just want to say, you know, trauma escapes and, and and the way it kind of suggests how we think about trauma also gives us a way not to get locked into the low hanging fruit kind of thinking about trauma and and really open it up so that people are not stuck in a, in a situation in Ukraine where it's all there, there is only kind of one way of supporting them um, and of course grief if you think about people grief you know in in within the PTSD <coughs> paradigm you know we have things like because of the kind of you know the, the sort of medical cloak that's put on top of it we have things like complicated grief disorder in the west so people who are who are grieving for more than two years in ways that are kind of seen as uncontainable or quote unquote unhealthy are diagnosed with complicated grief disorder so all of ukraine is going to have complicated grief disorder so people will not ever stop grieving it will be forever right for the for those people who who were there and, and for their children and so forth so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a trap if it becomes if it's kind of just taken on without um, other other ideas and other models and other ways of thinking about trauma uh, sort of being as available and as visible and as talked about as a kind of PTSD one of the things I think I will take away from what you just said is let's try and think what these sites do to us and not rush in to do something to them. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really important thing. That's right. I am. I have so many other questions I want to ask, but I am going to control myself and open the floor to discussion now. So please, if anybody has any questions that like to ask, put your hand up. Uh, and I might collect them in. Shall I collect them, or shall we just go? No, one let's by just one? do one. Let's go one, one by one. So I'm, I'm not. There. I'm not young anymore. Like, I'm not <laughs> I can write them down for you, <laughs> gentlemen. There. Right, thanks for your talk. Um, unfortunately, I didn't read your books. Um, but can you Yet. tell us a bit? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit of the sites of trauma? What do you remember from your childhood? Do you remember? Is there is there a connection there? And um, can you give us examples? Concrete. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think, as you said, that the, the, the place that came into my head was Babin Yar, and of course uh, are in Kiev, which is the site of uh, the largest, um, I think, in, in terms of just in one space, the largest uh, massacre of uh, not only Jewish people, Jewish residents of Kiev, but also um, other, other groups as well. Um, and I think um, this was this was a place that you know, where we lost members of our family. This was a place that... Um, during the Second World War? Right? During the Second World War, yeah. In the what is kind of known as the Holocaust by bullet. Um, and so to me, I, to me, that place was kind of really, really significant. It wasn't memorialized for a very long time. During the Soviet Union, there was no mention of the Jewish people. It was all to kind of, you know, the Soviet, the Soviet citizens who were, whose lives were lost. There was a lot of obfuscation. There is also a history of tragedy that happened, like a natural disaster that happened there. So a really, really complicated place that went through many, many chapters. Um, and I, I remember going there with my daughter, who was 12 at the time, so well before, well before 2014. I'm just trying to now kind of date, everything is now kind of dated either to 2014 or 2022. Um, and I remember her saying to me, oh, this is really beautiful. And I had a kind of really strong reaction. No, it's not beautiful. These are, you know, the bodies of the people. And then I had lots of conversation with people about who also, who knew the history, felt it very deeply, but also felt that this was, you know, because nature took over some of it and there was a memorial now, that that was um, a, a place of of beauty as well of, as of uh, tragedy and of course in March 2022 it was it was shelled it was one of the first kind of uh, one of the first things that happened uh, within sort of week two I think week think two of the full scale. Huh? Do you think it was targeted? Um, they targeted the TV tower uh, the the memorial in Kharkiv I think was targeted and we just recently saw images a uh, rabbi one of the rabbi well, the main rabbi I think went there and, and took footage and I think that was deliberately targeted but 
Um, I think in case of Baibing Yara, it was a clerk. I think, what do you think? Well, Look, you know, ultimately, yes. Because if you, if you do what Russia has been doing, you are, and they have been targeting not just, um, you know, um, civilian infrastructure, but they have been targeting um, sites of memory and sites of culture. We, we know all the libraries, all the institutions, all the cultural centres that have been destroyed and, and, and cemeteries. And, and of course, um, yeah, memorial sites. So, in terms of in terms of my childhood and a really significant place, that would probably be um, that. And then the the layer of incredulity: Are you seriously doing this? You're seriously now, you know, shelling by the yard. And then, of course, that incredulity grew, grew, and then it exploded. And then nothing was left of it. And now it's just an understanding that this is. A genocide that is being perpetuated. No longer, no longer incredulity. Just, just recognition of that. I seem to remember that that was one of the moments when this uh, idea of denazifying Ukraine started to fly yeah. out of the window. Finally, here, yeah. you know, so the people went, yeah. "Aha, okay, uh, that's one way to de denazify Ukraine <laughs> is by is by shelling um, such an important site of memory of the Holocaust." Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sorry, there was, I think yeah, there was a question there. Jonathan, yes. Well, I'll come back to the point you made about the, the sort of outrage and vitriol in the papers where mm. you know people felt that they couldn't write about certain things or book publications. There seems to be a parallel there to the kind of vitriol that came out of the debate when uh, visas were denied to Russians, the debate about that. Yeah. Um, do you think it's just because people are really fighting for their privilege as opposed to rights? Rights come with responsibilities mm. and the things you mentioned there, whereas privilege is just uh, you have and you don't and you feel That's really that's a really kind of meaningful distinction. I hadn't thought about it in in those terms. I'm obviously thinking now about the kind of uh, people not being able to enter an increasing number of countries with in, in Russian vehicles, right? And the vitriol um, about it, and the kind of the the, the way in which so many um, Russian sort of Russians abroad uh, who who left um, after the, the start of the uh, full-scale invasion, find ways to feel like the victims of what's going on. I mean, it takes incredible mental acrobatics after everything that we know. And of course, in the West, you know, you're no, no longer watching, you know, uh, Margarita Simonian and, and Russian TV. You know exactly what's going on. And yet the, the way in which that self-victimization and a sense, and, and that's where the cancellation of Russian culture and all the ways, you know, and Marsha Gessen quitting, you know, the board of uh, Penn International. And, and, and again, and I wonder about it and I think, is that because that war is not real to you? Because yes, it is extremely inconvenient and yes, you know, and then of course we get the rhetoric. This is how you're helping Putin by doing this because the the you know the good Russians are being increasingly kind of ostracized and 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 and, and placed under an increasing pressure and, and being told that Europe doesn't want them, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is you know this you are you're working with Putin side and side. And but but you just think so when you think like that, that means that what is happening in Ukraine is not real. So unless it's your homes and your children, and, and of course we know, and I, and I have many examples, and Alisa, you would have examples of people who would say to, and, and these are, it's a slightly different example, because these are people who are still in Russia, who would say to their relatives in Ukraine, talking to them from basements, they would say, that's bullshit. They brainwashed you, you know, and, and sisters, no longer talking to sisters, that's, that's personal examples. Um, and, and, and people absolutely, mothers and daughters, you know, the most primary of human relations, absolutely refusing to accept the reality of what's happening in Ukraine. So one of my theories about that is that to me, one of the great components of what it is to be patriotic, not nationalistic, but patriotic, is the capacity to feel shame for your country. And I think that there is such an incredible, all-pervasive discomfort with the idea that you would do anything not to feel shame. And you will invest yourself in the idea of the great Russia of tomorrow, in the idea of the opposition, the idea of the resistance, in the idea of being victims. 
because somehow you just think you will be obliterated by shame. But there is no way around it. What is happening can only, you know, that is the, the step that cannot be kind of avoided. And yet we, we see that all the time. Why would Marsha Gessen not say, you know, I'm sorry, and I am getting the fuck out of here, right? <laughs> Why recenter yourself again and your own sense of being wronged? Because what's happening in Ukraine is not sufficiently real, because it's not under your skin, because you're not waking up in the middle of the night wondering who is alive and who is not. I, I don't know. And, and because there is this incapacity to feel profound shame for your country. And that is, you know, I, um, I, I have come to believe that as a teacher, that's what I'm teaching. I say to my students, I am trying to grow in you the capacity to feel shame. Without it, there is no love, there is no responsibility, there is no justice. But that's, yeah, what's my feeling? The feeling of shame question. is so closely connected to responsibility that we were talking yeah, about yeah. and the admission of complicity. That's and right. I think that is the step that is so hard to make. But, but you're right, I think the feeling... And people, people would do anything not to do that, yeah. right? Not to say, they would do everything to say, this is not about me. Yeah. So um, um, so that was a hand up there, um, Oyam, um, before Steve, I'll come back to you, but I, I would like to very actively encourage women to ask questions as well, because we're going to have three questions from men, and then some questions from women, and then I'll come to you. Um, there's, one, there's one in the front already, excellent, so you can wait a little bit, thank you. Yes. Oh, yes, uh, I just wanted to ask if you want to elaborate more on why you refer to it as a genocide, which I personally agree on, but it's something that in the Western media at least is very um, like a phenomenon basically, and it's the same for other situations like uh, in Palestine, or it's just a term that is is never used and is completely too charged, and it, there's always the opinion that it's there's always an equality between the two parties in some way. So I just wanted to hear your explanation uh, for this term. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of Ukrainian scholars have done the work of actually looking at the definition of genocide from 1946 and, and putting two things together, the, the reality that is no longer covered up and no longer the denazification is gone, that whatever other things you know, it's it's all gone, and we now know that the 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 very idea is for Ukraine to stop existing, right? And it's I don't understand to why. I mean, I sort of understand, but part of me maybe refuses to understand why there is, as you say, such an incredible resistance to the idea of using the word genocide. And the only way in which we can sort of get there is through children. Right. And this was the only kind of, you know, the kidnapping of children and the idea that children will be taken away and, and, and told to hate Ukraine and, 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 and their families and their inheritance. And of course, that the arrest warrant for Putin and the terrible woman, you know, somehow is the only kind of way in which that notion of genocide um, is entertained by the West. Forgive, forgive me putting the word genocide and entertained in one sentence. But... Um, and I really don't understand because if you actually look at the definition and if you look at what is beyond kind of <coughs> debate uh, around, you know, what's happening, uh, and I don't need to list everything, we all know that, right? We all know what's been happening that is all about the eradication of Ukraine, the Ukraine's right to exist and, and Ukrainian people and Ukrainian identity and Ukrainian future, you know, you were talking about future. Um, and so why is the word genocide and, I, and i've had issues with that in australia as well where people took to like really um found it very um offensive for me to use that word i think it's offensive not to use that word so we just need you know we can, we can sort of explain i guess why that resistance is there but i'm past wanting to explain and understand it it just needs to be this is what's happening. It's no longer, it's no longer debatable. Um, you know, 576 days into the full-scale invasion. So, um, and is it, you know, is it 
kind of about the implication if you call a genocide what kind of actions will be required is it about that is it about that concept itself and how it's untouchable how you sort of can't get there um, at this point it's just you know um, there is only one response to that I, I, I think yeah so uh, but thank you thank you for asking that question I mean that that resistance in the face of evidence is uh, devastating Absolutely, absolutely devastating. And that's why it's so important to keep collecting evidence of war crimes and support those organizations in Ukraine that have been doing it from day one. Indeed, when I say day, day one, I mean 2014. Yeah. So they have, yeah. they have been collecting uh, evidence of war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, and uh, evidence of genocidal actions of the Russian state against If you watch Ukraine, Russian television for half an hour, just half an hour, that's enough. <laughs> they say it directly. Less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yes. Probably yeah. even less. Yeah. yeah. So William, then Steve, and then I'll collect more. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, to, to go back to the conversation about trauma states and, uh, and bugging out yeah. in places like that. So these are there's a lot of places like that in Ukraine, but not only in Ukraine, which are complicated places of memory where you know terrible and complicated things happen. Then on top of that, you have decades of kind of forced oblivion. And when you come into independent Ukraine, you know, the commemorative processes have not been particularly constructive or dynamic, let's say, you know, Bugging Out is a good example. Yeah. There's on the one hand this kind of chaotic commemorative activity happening there, on the other hand it's kind of neglected. Um, so I, I, I wonder, and, it, and it's a big problem and it's a big challenge for the Ukrainian state to know what to do with this sort of place. So I wonder, Based on your experience, your research, do you have a kind of, do you have some kind of pointers or advice to people trying to take turn these places into effective sites of memory? Like, what, what would make a good site of memory? Yeah. To solve these problems. So, so I think, uh, thank you, thank you for asking this question. Um, well, one thing to say is that um, when there was a um, a sort of a, a very in the 90s there was a competition of uh, memorials and counter memorials in Berlin to commemorate the murdered Jews in Germany and one of the sort of key memorial scholars who was also involved in those processes and was equally involved in the um, memorialization of Ground Zero um, in New York City James Young he said that there can be no final solution to the memorialization problem, right? To, to some extent, recognizing that memorialization is not, you know, and the idea to kind of close things off and kind of get it down and pin it down through some kind of memorial paradigm, that that in itself is a problem. The other thing is, I guess what I've been trying to say is move away from the idea that these are the only choices and you know, and there are ways of doing kind of, which is a form of memorialization, but not as we kind of know it, uh, I suppose. So for instance, in Sarajevo, which was the site of the longest modern day siege, although, you know, God knows, you know, hopefully Mariupol will not be, um, will not sort of trump that. It's uh, 1,395 days during, during the, um, you know, in, in, in 1990s um, and they have a variety of kind of responses to wanting to preserve the material fabric of um, one of the scholars uh, coined the term herbicide you know the systematic destruction of it and deliberate destruction of the city which is what happened to Sarajevo in 1990s and there is such a thing uh, that is called Sarajevo Rose where the you know the the um, indentations and holes in the pavement have been filled with red cement so on one hand it's functional and you walk and people strollers and people's you know legs don't get stuck in in the kind of various um you know dangerous imperfections of the pavement on the other hand you you know that that memory is there through through the kind of red cement and through you can't miss it. 
Um, you can't miss it. You can't miss it. Yeah, it's it's there. So it's still a form of memorialization, but I think it's a it's a different, non-monumental, non-kind of top-down form of memorialization. The kind of things about urban fabric thinks about people, thinks about walking, thinks about remembering, and doesn't think about those spaces as being put aside, cast aside as a kind of a separate category of places. You know, if you were to kind of want to keep and with Ukraine, because as Alessa said, you would have to, you cannot put things aside to the extent that they might represent um, um, horrific, uh, horrific tragedies and so forth that would have to be reintegrated. So how can you, how can you think about people, how people use those spaces, and how the question of walking, and the question of remembering, and the question of grieving, how these are all inseparable, and the question of intergenerational, intergenerational transmission, they're all kind of inseparable things. Um, and the other thing, um, I guess, um, to say to say to that. Um, you know, don't invite celebrity architects and celebrity, you know, whatever, uh, to go and do their big piece. So remove human ego, remove narcissism, remove um, all the celebrity bullshit, I think, from, um, from the memorial culture, um, sort of, um, all together. So, but yes. Um, and why focus on the communities that use those Focus spaces. on the communities. And uh, for instance, you know, one of the things that we need to realize, and this would, will be a very significant issue for Ukraine, in the absence of human remains, if families do not have bodies, places come to stand in for bodies. So when you think about it, what does that mean? How do you then approach a place that contains human remains that will be uh, the closest families can get to actually having the bodies of their dead ones? So that's, that, that takes you away from so much of what is kind of what has been done in terms of you know how we commemorate um, how if you think about these places these are the places that can take the burden of testifying from survivors so survivors and families do not have to endlessly testify this is what happened because this place will be a testifying kind of you know site then how do you approach that you're not going to put some big metallic object on top of it or whatever right you will you will have a different approach because you will be thinking about about people and thinking about people intergenerational at the same time it's the whole country how do you do it it's going to be just an enormous and very very difficult thing yeah how, how do you place the difference between some of those in the kind of west and high culture who really based around self-actualization which is a luxury and privilege to also have books in your home, yes. and Ukraine, which is fine for its security needs and has no privilege. How do you bridge that and shut that mm. difference down? Well, um, yeah, by by taking by disrowning the idea of culture. Mm. When I say you know culture has never meant less to me, that's precisely what I'm talking about. Yeah, and so as long as we're going to hold on and just like. You know, whatever else, we will not give up culture. You know, then, then, then I think there will be that rift that you are talking about, uh, and which is not to say. I mean, we know that there are incredible cultural things happening in Ukraine. They have happened all across in all the conflicts. They're happening in Syria. You know, they they, they happened in Afghanistan and continue to happen, etc. So it's not to suggest that sites, you know, of of genocidal wars stop producing culture there is incredible culture that is being produced but sort of recognizing that when you hang on to culture at the expense of people and communities that's that's when that's when you kind of create that incredible gulf yeah i saw a question did you have a question did you have your hand up earlier yeah pretty similar question uh -huh. but so you feel like it's been answered yep go for it, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think a lot um, about it. Um, 
I think, and I wonder, Alessa, how you feel about it. I think um, all Ukrainians, in, in various ways and wherever they are in, in diaspora or in Ukraine, our world ended, right? Our world has already ended and we're not trying to hang on to it. But for many people in universities, they're trying to hang on to, you know, to their areas of specialization. So I think there is a lot of problem from the faculty itself. You know, they're trying to hang on to, you know, if you've dedicated your entire life to Russian history or Russian language or Russian literature, whether you are, wherever you are from, right? It's very, very hard to give it up and you're gonna come up with this incredible edifice of explanation for why this is true knowledge, right? That needs to continue and needs to be imparted to young people. So, you know, when I said about shame, that once you, you know, that you can't move anywhere until that capacity is there, the capacity for loss, like, I, I just feel that people who are trying to hang on to the world as it was, to their, to their comforts, to their intellectual clout, to their conferences, to whatever, to their collaborations, to their grants, that they are really, and it's very human, it's very human and maybe, and I say to myself, well, you know, here I am, you know, if uh, I was just reading about Morocco right now or Libya right now, I would still be wanting to hold on to my, you know, to my privileges and my, and my um, comforts and, and my areas of intellectual expertise. So I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers, but I, you know, I'm saying these people are somehow, you know, despicable or whatever, but especially if they are Western, Western people who, who don't want to give up their, their, their privileges and so forth. But I think that's what it takes. You know, for so many people, the world has entered um, and, 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 and something, something else is emerging in its place, but you can no longer, you can no longer hang on to things. Um, but universities are places where people hang on to things. I, I say this as, you know, uh, and where, you know, your intellectual expertise and, and the, what that gets you is something that people are really prepared to give up. So I feel that if the pressure will comes from students, that's what I would like to see. And I was surprised to see, I thought in England, there would be more pressure from students saying, what, what the hell is going on? And why, why are you teaching this to us? And where are the subjects, you know? And, and it's happening, but I hope, I hope that, and I don't know if you feel that and encounter that, but that pressure and that lack of um, acceptance of the desire to just keep going as, as we were with some, tweaks here and there and, and a couple of subjects here and there to show that we are, you know, on the right side of history, but ultimately not doing not doing the work and the work of absolute upheaval, you have to turn it all inside out and, and, and in a way that's really, really hard and people are very resistant. But I hope young people will just keep demanding it. Can I take a close second? You know, young people in universities are taught this way. So they also adopt the idea that Russian culture is like the Russian culture is the high one, you know, it's something that should be valued and stuff. And basically, Western people, they don't really know the context that yeah. much, especially the ones who don't study with Western people. Yeah. So they still perpetuate this idea and the same style of teaching and like studying the Eastern European yeah. studies and stuff. So how, it's like, even if the generation changes, like if I was taught this way, I'm also going to go and teach this way because I think that's the true knowledge. So how do you change, how do you yeah. break this circle? What do you, what do you think? I think it's been broken already, and I completely agree with what you were saying that it's about. I have a very pragmatic uh, position here. It's 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 about quality of scholarship, um, and the students should demand adequate quality of scholarship, especially in uh, tu with tuition fees that the students are paying here. Um, and if that scholarship that we've acquired in the past, uh, the large part of it, failed us in understanding not just Ukraine. Ukraine practically wasn't being taught, full stop, at least in this country, very, very few universities do have, two universities have courses on Ukraine in this country. Um, but it also failed us in understanding or misunderstanding Russia. Uh, and it's, it goes back to the question of responsibility. It's about the scholars who have engaged in teaching the region, taking responsibility for producing the kind of scholarship that did not prepare us to the situ for the situation we're in. And I, I think it's changing. I think there's a lot of goodwill, and it only takes a critical mass of people to begin the big changes. 
Uh, and I think that critical mass is there. And there will always be the majority that will be reluctant. But I think if we keep applying that pressure, we have these discussions, we, we decolonize and de-imperialize our academia, then we'll be getting somewhere. It's a, it's a shame that, I mean, universities in general are extremely bureaucratic institutions and things take an awful lot of time. And so it's really important for us to not to lose our you know, strength and desire to keep these changes. It, it, it falls on us, unfortunately, to keep pushing and keep pressing. But, but, but it's changing already. And I, I'm very hopeful that you know, the, the, the quality <coughs> standard will change too. And um, I think this idea, Russian, like Russian culture, like really let's, let's break it down. Um, you know, n number one and number two, all of your Russianists were, had no idea what was coming, right? And did not, as Alessia said, did not prepare. So, you know, so on, on that basis, I, yeah. So many questions, and I can see most of them are from women, which is wonderful. I'm keeping you all in my mind for now, but men don't feel this. <laughs> I feel like I need to encourage you now. So um, we don't have an awful lot of time, so I might collect a couple of questions of the same. I will write them down so I can remind you. So a question from Olenka first, I saw you, and a question over there, and then I'll do the second round, but first those two. Uh, no, and Wally it, Sir Powell. Yes, and it really struck me, and it's something that really a lot of people are thinking about, how like you, if we're in the West, right, as a global north, and you're trying to reach those people who want to hang on to their beliefs, right? Yeah. So the empathy, kind of, like, what, what that conversation, and I hope you elaborate on that a bit more, shows that, like, the task of literature may not be to reduce this empathy in other ones, I, I wrote those down. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah. let, let's collect it. Yeah. So I uh, was listening to your last talk or something. I think there is a tension between Ukraine being this geographic space where these horrible things are happening now and we want all of the world eyes to be on it. And at the same time, being Ukraine, this creates this image of otherness. And that kind of what makes people slightly indifferent because they are Ukraine. Go Are you going to go okay. for it? Okay, okay. That's so multi-layered, these ones. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, if you think I'm going to somehow miraculously do it together, uh, you're wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the concept, thank you so much. Um, the, the conversation that you were referring to um, is with a, with a writer, Namwali Sopel. Um, it's somewhere online and read it for her, not for me, because it's, it's, it's about sort of her ideas primarily it's in the Yale Review, I think, on, on, their, on, on their website. Yes, I, th I think that's, yeah, that's where it is. Um, and um, it was prompted by a, a, an essay that she wrote. Um, um, I'm trying to remember, maybe even in the London Review of Books or New York Review of Books, I can't quite remember, um, where she really questioned the idea of empathy as the kind of, as A, the kind of the ultimate objective of good literature, and B, something that we actually really want to kind of produce as much as possible because it will make um, our world a better, more just, more ethical, less violent place. Um, and she talked about the idea of 
empathy as something where as, as, as a kind of as a privileged idea where people who you know have the privilege to kind of sit back and I think it goes back to what you were talking about to sit back and kind of decide that other people have the right to exist and um, and once they're convinced of that in their in their free time then they might begin to have strong feelings about it and and that idea of empathy always presupposes this idea of identification which is maybe one way that i can come back to maybe maybe there is a way to connect these two questions um this idea of identification so somehow you need to be able to imagine yourself in the shoes of another and that's what literature um supposes uh, or is supposed to kind of be able to give us right this entry points into the world of others and somehow we start interpreting the world of others and then while Sertel is really questioning that and she's talking about all the way in which we cannot be in the shoes of others and if our only mode of having moral feelings is by through the process of identification by thinking yes it could be me I could be the one in Ukraine I could be the one in Morocco I could be the one in Libya or it could be my, my daughter my mother etc then actually there is an enormous failure and, and most of the world gets left out most of the world that is not like us that we cannot imagine our way into and we are going to have you know a kind of a privileged space for our empathetic feelings leaving the rest of the world kind of outside of that framework um, and I was really really convinced by that idea and I and, um, and 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 really wanted with her you know guided by her to question this idea that literature is about um, giving us modes of inhabiting other people's lives what about all those people whose lives we cannot or if we think we can imagine uh, our way into their lives we're doing terrible violence we're, we're lying to ourselves we're you know we're really flattening those irreconcilable differences right what do we do with those experiences that we cannot imagine ourselves and members of our family <coughs> into and if how can we take away the idea of ad identification from our idea of having strong moral response um, and actually this somehow takes me back to William's question um, one thing about sort of trauma that I forgot to say that another concept and sites of trauma another concept uh, that I have been really interested in um, and it has emerged maybe in the last 10-15 years is the idea of a site of conscience and it's sort of connected and those sites um, and there is the international coalition of the sites of conscience and that kind of you know elevator sort of definition of what they're talking about they're talking about um, sites that move us into action right that there is a kind of a response so what is the mechanism right that is not based on identification that can move us into action right and I take your point of what are we left with um, but I, I think we are left with shame love justice irreconcilable differences um, not lying ourselves about being in someone else's <coughs> shoes and this is me trying to come back to you and and I, I think I totally agree I have been amazed to see how people who are in Ukraine are not locked into an experience that excludes other tragedies that are happening right now I mean we saw um, Ukrainians going to um, Syria and Turkey uh, in the aftermath of the earthquake you know we see so many so many examples there is as, as you say there is um, a lot of learning um, as well that it, that is happening and it's not and I don't think it's based on identification right there is a lot of work happening with the global south that again comes from the civil society that the the top-down sort of echelons have bungled we know that right but it's very much organically coming uh, from the civil society from what I I can see and so again the world doesn't need to be like Ukraine for for the moral feelings and for that kind of move to action to be there and to be real so I, I absolutely agree and thank you thank you for saying that and perhaps I have made some tenuous connections via you know sites of trauma there but um, yeah thank you in theory we have five minutes so can I just ask those of you who wanted to ask questions to put your hands up so I uh, get the geography of this uh, right I, there were two questions I think on that so I can only see yeah two here two here 
one here. Excellent. Uh, we can do this in five minutes now. Can we stay a little bit longer? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're missing out on wine time, but that's <laughs> that's okay. So I. What if people go and get wine and then we are? <laughs> we can last do that. We, we, we can do that too. Prepared. Very but quietly. Then, but then it's difficult. I mean, I think it's if difficult. someone is yeah. really desperate. <laughs> <laughs> no judgment. Um, so please, um, a young woman does that. Yeah. No, no, you, yeah, yeah. I'm just looking for a young woman. <laughs> a woman, a woman in this group. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, let me try to frame it, but um, I'm just wondering if, um, uh, if you would think that uh, what is happening now uh, in Ukraine uh, will force finally to West, the West to consider or to re reconsider what uh, the Eastern Europe, or so-called Eastern Europe, it's not a homogenous space. Uh, because if you, for example, I've been to the bookshop today, to four grand bookshops. If you think about the contemporary history of, of, of so-called Eastern Europe, it's one miserable shell. <laughs> and then Russia is the uh, yeah. 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 So that's one example, but we, because I'm not Ukrainian, I'm Polish. Uh, there's a lot of shame there <laughs> in terms of uh, especially what's happening right exactly now what the Polish uh, government is doing. But there's this idea that uh, everything the, of the so-called uh, Warsaw Pact or the Soviet state is kind of one thing. And that, that idea seems to me to be still present very much. And the thing very much kind of second class Europe. Finally, yeah. a moment where, where hopefully the, the West can understand it's not. And then there's this Europe and, and, and Eastern Europe thing, like football and women's football that I like to, you know, this <laughs> yeah, yeah. sort of second class. So and another question here, and we'll, 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 I'll keep persuading you to pair them. <laughs> I had a question regarding, uh, so I have, um, I've been traveling in Ukraine since you know, two years war and every day and doing everything I can. And so I'm an artist and activist and I can really see how, and even in newspaper or in the UK, the narrative is becoming much more about how we start to, not start to forget, but like, oh, let's leave a space for some Russian people that we're going to interview so that it's more balanced. Or, and that makes me ill. <laughs> but um, I think there is a danger there that we are moving more towards not forgetting, but like, oh, sorry to make things more equal. And how can we, as artists and activists and everybody else who cares, like, I'm always trying to find ideas to do more, but I'm also feeling that, you know, my friends and family, they know where I stand, but I always try mm. to find new ways so you've mentioned that you were inspiring artists as well. So well, have you seen some good initiatives? Because I think we need to keep sharing that so that we don't, we can make sure that our voices keep being held. Because I think we're competing against powerful forces that don't want these voices to be held. So I'm just looking for new ideas and things that we all can do because I think that can help. Mm. In terms of things we all can do, I think I would feel like a fraud. I, I think I would need to defer to Alessia. Donate, um, the, <laughs> please, the support. Ukrainians uh, inside the country who are fighting in the front line. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, as a person who's not there, I, it's not it's not my place um, to, to, to. I will respond to, to yeah, the yeah. first part of your mm -hmm. question, with, um, but um, I'm not I'm not risking my life, and yeah. I'm not worried about my children every minute of every day. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to be, yeah. But. Um, in terms of sorry, but I should go to see your clearing. It doesn't have no time at all. It's a flawed, flawed okay. system. <laughs> I accept it. <laughs> it's flawed. It's flawed. It's flawed. It's flawed. It's flawed. It's flawed. But now I might start backwards because it's, now it's in my head what you asked. It's interesting, isn't it? I don't know if people feel that that there is some kind of a. Um, so we learned that lesson about both sideism with climate, climate um, justice, right, and, 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 and climate, climate crisis, right. We understood that, you know, 10 scientists, um, you know, who talk about climate justice and 10 morons who, you know, you know, like that's not journalism. It seems like the lesson has been learned, sort of. And then, as you say, uh, after a certain amount of time, we keep coming back to that kind of sweet spot of just like we need to we need to have the balance. And then and the FT, I mean, one of the articles that I was reading, yeah. there was an interview with a Russian oligarch yeah. who was saying, oh, but you know, there are two sides and good people and bad people and both right. sides. I'm like, this is the FT. This is really dangerous yeah. narrative. Yeah. And that is said and, you know, not qualified. So I'm just, you know, 
Yeah, and, and I think it's happening everywhere, like in the um, Ksenia Sapchak in the New Yorker profile of her as a kind of a, a complex oppo oppositional figure, just un, 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 kind of un, unbelievable. So what is this appetite? Either it's about sort of balancing things out, as you say, or there is that appetite for the stories of, you know, good Russians, so-called good Russians, that is inextinguishable somehow, that the West cannot give up on the, on the need for that story of, of, the, of the Russian heroes, right? I, I don't know, what, what do you think, Alyssa? Is that, is that like that after a certain period of time, journalism just kind of defaults into that, into that kind of, on one hand, on the other hand, some, some you know, everyone is implicated sort of narrative, or is it about a kind of a... Oh, it's not just journalism, right? It's politics as well. It's this idea of neutrality. So apparently for the first eight years of the war, we've been neutral. We haven't. We've done a lot of things by trading with Russia to facilitate the escalation of the war. And this conversation has to be had everywhere. It's not just about journalism, mm. it's about all aspects, I'm afraid, of, of our responsibility. Mm. I think responsibility is going to be a kind of thread throughout this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And what about homogeneity of Eastern Europe? Yes, yes, I, I, I remember See, that. I do remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but thank you, I'll, I'll keep, I, I feel like I haven't given you a good enough answer um, but, but it's, a, it's, it's a question for me, um, and, and I think there are, and I think journalism, and as you say, it's politics as well, I mean, the idea of neutrality as rigor, uh, you know, again, and, and the idea of if you take a side, you are no longer in the business of reporting, which is, you know, and I remember Philip Gurevich who uh, reported from Rwanda, uh, and he said that not to take a side in, in a genocide being, yeah. you know, that is, that is the absolute failure of journalism. But the narrative of what it is to be a journalist, I think is very powerful, right? And, and so I, I think it's there. And of course, neutrality gives you uh, plenty of ways to do nothing, right? And, and, and to justify the continued trade, the continuing um, um, sort of political machinations and, and so forth. So it ha definitely has very strong kind of political um, uh, edge to it, but I, I just think we really need to completely throw away the idea of neutrality as equal to rigor, um, as equal to the best journalistic practice. You know, if we're talking about good Russians, you know, someone like Anna Polivkovska, you know, she, when she went to Chechnya, she was not neutral, right? And, you know, and she did the, the, the best work that could have been done there uh, at, at, at that point in history. So, um, and yet, and yet the, the, the um, fraudulent little narrative about neutrality persists, yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the homogeneity of um, Eastern Europe, um, again, I feel like I, I, and this is not, this is just because I respect so much your incredible mind, not because I'm, I'm trying to hide behind you or <laughs> behind you in answering those questions. I mean, I went to um, Foils uh, today too, and I saw bloody Alain de Poiges and his history of Russia. And this is a terrible, terrible man. He's terrible. He has done so much damage, and that's before 2014. And yet in Britain, he's still the foremost historian, not just of Russia, but of the region. He still gets to, for the London Review of Books, he still gets to review, you know, all, all the kind of the key texts that are uh, historical texts coming out from the region. So, I can't believe you know he's there and he's taken up so much space and as you say the rest of Eastern Europe is you know um, shelved somewhere and, and it's abysmal. So what do you think, Alessia? <laughs> <laughs> I have all the answers. Um, one of I think one of the answers for me is to obviously to decenter uh, our perception of Europe as a whole and to stop treating Eastern Europe not just as homogenous but also as some kind of secondary in in its um, epistemic value uh, and to understand that we all have a relationship with Moscow that is different from the relationship that Paris, Berlin, London has with Moscow and therefore we have the kind of knowledge that they lack so we need to be listened to but we have different knowledge as well it differs from the countries differ from one another and for me it, you know, obviously I will advocate for Ukraine now not just because Ukraine is being threatened, but also because I mean, I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute. One way 
to do that is to translate uh, what is being written, said, spoken in Ukraine for so long. Um, for so long, uh, you know, Ukrainian intellectuals, Ukrainian writers have been raising really difficult, important topics, but they were not heard outside of Ukraine because so few people studied the Ukrainian language, so few people could penetrate that field of literature. So it's really important that those shelves are filled not only. But do you think it was not only with not that that the lack of an interest? It was more that. The Western really cared. No, no, we, well, it's a combination, right? Because now there is a desire to learn, and then you go to the shelves in libraries as well as book sh bookshops, and you still don't see what you do see. The growing number of books tend to be by, and I'm here quoting a translator of ours, uh, of <laughs> ours, I, I decided to own you, Daisy, Daisy Gibbons over there, and this is something that Daisy said, I'm paraphrasing now, that you know that what you see is often still to this day Ukraine spoken on behalf of people who visited it from, I don't know, a week to a year to 10 years, but they're not necessarily the ones that are in Ukraine writing about Ukraine in Ukrainian and we translating and accessing that information. So the will is there to learn, the material is still lacking. And one, one way to do it is to shine the light on the literature that is, and we're talking about literature, but obviously this applies to all sorts of other things mm -hmm. that is inside the country. Um, I really don't want to take up more space with my ideas. Anna, you change no, your mind? Yeah, I think now, no, I think it's now, I just wanted to suggest that maybe we should slowly close the discussion <laughs> because I think we could go on and on and on. And we could continue uh, more kind of silently, informally, informally uh, a having a glass of wine. Of wine. Absolutely. So if you all agree, yes. we could. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. time and all of you for coming but also can I encourage all of you to read Maria Tomakin it's such a joy it's such a treat to read her writing it was described I think in LA Review of Books the style of writing as possessing heat and intimacy and I could really agree with that description so please go away and if you haven't read the books yet do um, and yeah come to our next event support the Ukrainian Institute London if you can thank you thank, thank you, you.